I'm Sandra Leah, Director of Education and Patient Advocacy at Obesity Action. Meet my co-host, Rachel Atkins. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel. I'm the Director of Strategy with Obesity Action. Obesity Action is a new nonprofit organization for people living with elevated weight and obesity. It was formed by patient advocates whose focus is to provide evidence-based education and advocate for public policy and environmental changes that enable well-being. And if we can do that, we are one step closer to acceptance and inclusion of millions of people in larger bodies. Obesity Action is bringing together a community of seekers, hoping to find a solution aimed at healing the mind, body, and spirit. Together, we'll create a community of enlightened and connected people who nourish and love and accept our bodies. The Eat, Play, Love Spotlight series runs weekly interactive events and with experts. The first half of the episode is an interview, and then we turn the spotlight on you, the audience, to address questions and comments in a safe and supportive environment. These events are brought to you by Obesity Action and our collaborators, Raptors 905 and AA Clinic Research. In this episode, Food Addiction, in the time of COVID-19, we talked to Dr. Peter Shelby and Dr. Vera Tarman. So welcome, Peter and Vera. Please, I, I want you to take a few moments to introduce yourselves and tell us how and why you got into addiction treatment. Peter, can you go first? Uh, sure, thank you. So I started off my career as a family doctor and uh, when I was treating people in my primary care practice at Mount Sinai uh, in Toronto, I noticed a lot of people were coming in with, uh, you know, people couldn't figure out if the person had pain or an addiction and it uh, really, you know, and, and these people were falling through the cracks. So that's what got me interested. I then went to what was that back then known as the Addiction Research Foundation, a world-renowned institution in, in the world, actually, and, and, uh, and in Toronto. And I did a rotation there, and I studied more. And the more I studied, the more I got interested. And so, you know, and I then did both family medicine and addiction, and then gradually spent more time with addiction. Interesting. And you, Vera? Um, hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Vera Tarman. Um, my interest in um, addiction, um, I was uh, doing um, a lot of HIV medicine in the 90s, and uh, I lived downtown, like I said earlier, Church in Wellesley. And when uh, the um, medications came in and, you know, virtually turned the world of HIV into from a fatal disease to a chronic disease, um, I didn't want to do general medicine. Um, so then the other option was addiction medicine because I'm living in the heart of it here uh, and got very, very interested in that. And then in my work in, in addiction, um, the uh, uh, what I, I was working in sort of new recovery, sort of people coming into treatment. So I was a treatment doctor. And what I kept seeing, and this is why I'm here today, I guess, um, is that people would um, stop their drug, whether it be alcohol, cocaine, tobacco, or whatever. Well, they didn't stop tobacco. Uh, that's another conversation in itself, but alcohol, cocaine, and then they would pick up food. And I saw that so frequently that I, it, it became um, um, a, a clinical interest of mine. And then as I got more interested, I became more involved in that whole world. And so that that's become my sort of passion outside of my work. Yeah, and we share that passion of food addiction. And the question always comes up, food is a necessity of life, we need to eat to survive. So how is it that food can be addictive? How can food addiction even exist? So I take it I'm going to answer that question. Yes. 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 Okay. So, so that you're absolutely right. Food is something that we need to eat. And um, if we uh, think about food as, uh, you know, it has a somewhat intoxicating effect in that we use food for comfort, we use food for uh, to, to soothe ourselves or just for pleasure. So there's a sort of in, a certain level of which the brain is quite sustainable to eat natural foods. But when we move into the food environment of today, where the food engineering has been manufactured, we're taking um, what is an intoxicant and making it into what well, just a mild intoxicant we're making it into a stronger intoxicant and then then we can just call it a drug um, and then if it's even too much of a drug it becomes a toxin and 
uh, that's when food becomes not just enticing, uh, but actually addictive. And that's done uh, thanks to the food industry of today. And um, we have enough research now in, um, uh, you know, starting with Dr. Nicole Avina a, a number of years ago and on and on, showing that, yes, in fact, food is addictive. And uh, I, I'm, I can answer this question a little later, if you like. Um, I'm convinced now that not only can we see, and I think most of us acknowledge, food can be addictive. And when I talk about food, I'm talking mainly about processed food, mainly sugar. So really, we could say sugar or processed uh, carbs. Um, then uh, those can actually develop a food addiction syndrome in and of itself. But uh, that's another question. So why do you think, Vera, it is just not widely accepted? Why do we have so many healthcare professionals that really push against this idea that people can be addictive to certain foods? You know, it's uh, the, the thing that I hear is, well, you kind of said it earlier, it's like, well, you can't stop eating food, so how can it be addictive? Um, but, you know, when, when, we, when those of us in the field, we're not talking about food, we're talking about processed, engineered, sugar, processed carbs, things that are not food, they're manufactured drugs, essentially, let's just call it what it is. Um, and... Uh, uh, so, so there's a societal sense of maybe it's a confusion or an unwillingness to say these drugs are actually not food, uh, you know, and, and the food industry has marketed these drugs as being um, a purveyors of love and of, of, of acceptance and it's Thanksgiving and it's Christmas, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't want to take that away. So there's this societal thing, which, you know, you and I, Sandra, and those of us in the field are constantly trying to erode and say, love is love, uh, uh, but this is not love, this is poison. So there's, there's a societal piece. And then I think that there's definitely an economic interest. I mean, who's going to fund me to, uh, you know, speak against the food industry? It's why I'm so thrilled that people like Michael Moss just had their book published, you know, a sort of a triumph against the food industry. Um, I, but it takes an investigative journalist to speak that. Somebody like me, I don't have the, the time and the funds. There, there's an investment against it. And just finally, I'll say uh, that there's probably a, a professional interest too, because we already have ways to explain aberrant food, you know, eating disorder, um, uh, just, just comfort eating, problematic eating. Um, and we have to, this is where we are right now with the DSM-5, we have, to, we have to distinguish ourselves from those prevalent models and make ourselves a separate model. And that takes a lot of work and that's, it's a work in progress right now. Yes, well said. Over to you, Rachel. Yeah, well, I wanted to turn the lens to Peter. You know, we all keep hearing about how the rates of addiction have really skyrocketed through, um, you know, the past few months because of COVID-19. So, you know, uh, can you share with us, what, what are the drivers for that? Why is that happening? So, you know, so I'll take a little step back. I mean, if you think about addiction in general, maybe the term is needs a re-examination because really what we are talking about is a dysregulated consumption. So we are hardwired to consume, but there are usually checks and balances in our consumption, you know, natural, internal to us and external to us, right? So when those systems either promote excess consumption or there is an internal problem with that consumption because the brain got sensitized or got trained to consume, then you see this dysregulation where people just lose that, that ability. And then there are nice, you know, we've just published a paper led by Lori Zavatalo uh, in my team and, and uh, talking about the parallels between tobacco and, and, and uh, and food addiction. But when you look at why during a time of stress does do people end up consuming is it's very simple. If you look at the brain, what happens to the brain is your brain releases stress hormones. And when our, brains, our brain releases stress hormones, the connection between the brakes, which is it tells us not to consume and the drives kind of gets like, it's like oil on a brake. So then the drive is seeking comfort. And, and that then goes to the things that are known to release brain chemicals that feel comfortable, which are natural endorphins. And it's mediated through a brain chemical possibly called dopamine, I mean, called dopamine. So when you see that, when people are put in stressful situations, that is how you'll end up doing that. So that's one driver. But then you have the, also the issues of less activities, less things to do, more opportunities to consume. 
less expenditure. So all of those things can lead to overconsumption, which then has its downstream effects with more calories and in intake and more weight gain. But you know, we have to separate those things out a little bit because they interact with each other. Your environment is always interacting with your, your brain. And I think this idea that, you know, it's all your fault, it's your control is a spurious one uh, because we do not live in a vacuum. You know, it's easier to make healthier or less, you know, less harmful choices when the environment promotes a healthier environment. And, and, and so, so we have to look at that balance. Mm, I love the idea that it, I mean, it really sounds like it's the perfect storm, right? Um, and we kind of need to give ourselves that opportunity to say, it's okay. It's not necessarily your fault. There's a lot going on. Um, you know, I know that I really value your expertise and, and what you've done in tobacco is, you know, tobacco addi addiction is amazing. So, you know, can, can I ask you, you know, what, what do you find in tobacco addiction that we can relate to food addiction that could be helpful for us? What have you learned? So, you know, it's very interesting. And it, it's just like what Vera said, like when people quit tobacco, they gain weight, uh, often can gain, but not everybody, but some do. And it's the substitution is one reason, but there are other reasons. If you look at the brain regions involved with addiction, there is a lot of overlap, not only in the brain regions that are involved with this consumption and this dysregulated consumption, but also the brain chemicals, like I said, dopamine. So for example, I mean, there are limitations because many of the studies in food, you know, have been done in people who are obese. And that's, we, we shouldn't necessarily say they're the same thing. We, the outcome might be obesity, but it, it's not the same thing. Uh, but, but the brain chemicals that regulate pleasure in, in food consumption and pleasure in addiction are the same pathways. Also, there are more and more we're learning about hormones that the gut hormones that we have that are, you know, that, that uh, are, and, and certain receptor agonists that are now being used to treat uh, diabetes and obesity, those same drugs are effective in alcohol and other addictions. We also know that people who have the bypass surgery for the weight loss surgeries can then let, suddenly land up with a very bad and severe alcohol problem. Mm -hmm. So we know that there are those similarities. We know from that perspective. Then there are other similarities. You know, people who've experienced childhood trauma uh, are twice as likely to not only develop uh, obesity, but also twice as likely to develop addictions. So there are these common factors that we are seeing uh, that, that come together. And then the last one I'll say is that we know that when people quit smoking, their gut bacteria flip into the similar gut bacteria that obese people have. So, it, so there are some uh, lots of areas of research that we have to start looking at. Uh, and that's why it's so fascinating for me. And that's why I'm more and more as I'm, my thinking is evolving is that maybe if we take a step back that all of these things are disorders of consumption, dysregulated consumption, that the factors lie in what happened to you as a child, the factors lie with what happened to you now, what's happening with your biology and what's happening with your environment. And you put them all together to get that perfect storm. I, I feel so lucky that we have experts like you that are really looking at the bigger picture and bringing this all together and using the things and tools that we have in one area and bringing that into, you know, the other area and, and kind of leveraging those successes. So kind of, I guess, flipping the lens. Yes. Can I add to that? Because I want to add course. one more piece. Uh, uh, um, Peter, when you said that um, uh, you, at some point in the past, you said that um, t uh, food addiction is probably the closest to tobacco addiction over the other addictions. And I thought about that and I thought clinically that's absolutely true because when you look at something like a heroin addiction or uh, even a cocaine addiction, the high is what, four, five, six hours, something like that. The high of a cigarette is if you're lucky an hour, it's usually a half an hour and then you need yeah. another cigarette. Yeah. And similarly with sugar, it, you don't, it doesn't last for four hours. Hours. You need it again in a half hour to an hour. Yeah. So it's that little bit, but quick, like frequent, frequent yeah. pit stops as opposed to the big, that's a, that, I think that's why when, when we try to quit um, eating sugar, it's like trying to quit smoking. 
it, it, in many ways, you're right, because you feel as you know, immediately you feel that down, right? Because yes. what happens is, so we think what happens, if you look at the, there's something called dopamine in the brain, and there are a certain number of receptors we all have. I think of them as sockets where, 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 where a plug goes into. People who are with addiction have lower levels, and so do people who, now we'll say it, obesity, have lower levels. Uh-huh. But when they consume, it, it goes up higher, but they, don't, they have to keep it going to make sure they feel normal. Because when they don't, then they don't feel normal. They, we call it dysphoric. You feel kind of blah. And that then drives that reason to go continue to eat it. And, and, you know, it's not necessarily a craving where there's that urge, I, I got to have it. It can get to that. But often it's just, I just don't feel comfortable. I just need that. Mm-hmm. And, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's that I just need I it. Just need it. Oops. Oops. There's a bit of, yeah. I think there's a bit of an echo. Um, well, uh, let's turn the lens to Vera. Like uh, now that we're starting to talk about maybe sort of on the other side of that, how do we deal with this addiction? I know Vera, you have done so much work in food addiction. Could you outline for us, you know, those steps that we need to take to deal with a food addiction? Um, yes. Okay. So I think that the, the, the first thing we absolutely need to do is acknowledge that, um, uh, determine if it is actually an addiction for you. And I think that in society, if we're eating the foods of today, chances are we're already addicted at some level, maybe not at a clinically, at a syndrome level, but you know, there's a bit of a struggle already. But, it's, but if a person is coming into my office, chances are they're already at some level where they need help. And so I can say, uh, I, my first task would be, let's identify that, it, are you suffering from food addiction? Because if you don't go, if you don't go take that step, you're not willing to take the next step, which is, if I have a food addiction, if I'm willing to acknowledge that that food, probably sugar, processed processed carbs is a drug, then I can now use the tools in the addiction uh, um, uh, paradigm. And those tools are things like abstinence, they're things like support, they're uh, um, all the tools that come from the addiction um, uh, toolbox. Um, And they're not tools that people want to use because people want to learn how to moderate eating uh, sugar um, and most likely have been doing that all their life. And to say, no, we're going to one day at a time for sure, but we're going to try to get you to stop this Uh, because if it is an addiction and your food, your mind is drugged by the food, any amount of therapy, any amount of uh, uh, mindfulness it just doesn't have the impact when you're drugged, essentially. So uh, I would say, number one, identification that you have an addiction so that you can go to number two, which is abstinence, which then number three, now how do I stay abstinent? And that's where all those tools are like mindfulness, cognitive therapy, the steps in in the step program, whatever it is. Um, uh, So that's bottom line what we got to do. <laughs> so I want to pick up on the word abstinence because sometimes yes. it's a little confusing for people, especially when this idea is new to them. And so this idea that they're not going to have sugar anymore. And what does that even look like? Is it fruits and fruits as well? Is it only certain sugars? Can I have sweeteners? Can I, you know, can I yeah. everything in moderation? You know, it can be so overwhelming, this idea of abstinence. Yeah, so that's exactly. And, and um, generally, we would say, you know, what is it that has been um, uh, taken out of its natural element and made into a, a highly potent form? And uh, so sugar, for sure, because sugar in and of itself is already processed. If we eat the sugar like fructose in an apple, and it's within the apple, that's fine. But you take the apple, the sugar out of the apple, and now we've got something that's uh, uh, a toxin. It's 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 potentiated beyond so that we have to have that neuro adaption that Peter was referring to, which leads to addiction. So um, generally, I would say, let's start with sugar, and really any processed carbs, not carbs like regular vegetables. I'm not suggesting that we just do proteins and fats. I think that we can eat complex carbs, but basically from nature, like that phrase, just eat real food. And then for people who are along the line, they're, they've been food addicts for so long, um, some people may find that they ha- there are triggers that 
not for somebody else. Like some people can't do dairy. Some people can't do cheese. Some people can't do uh, even uh, some of the carbs like uh, potatoes uh, because it's too triggering. So we start with sugar and then we, we, through the use of people like you, Sandra, and people in the field where you have a coach, somebody who's helping you to say, okay, is this a trigger? Yes, it is off. No, it's not. Let's keep going. Yeah. So what so is it? Can, can you describe trigger foods for people? Yeah. Trigger foods are, are uh, foods that um, you, you, you want more, like even when you're full, you still want more. So if I, I mean, I love cauliflower, but when I'm full, I don't want more cauliflower. I'm just full. But uh, if I, if I go to the buffet table and then there's a, you know, a candied, uh, some, some kind of vegetable and I want that, then that's become a trigger. Um, if, if I eat cheese and now I want more cheese or I want more dairy or I want something else, it's a trigger. Some people can eat nuts and they're great. And other people, I have one nut and I want the whole tin. Um, uh, so it's any, any food that does not satisfy or the satisfaction is not um, satiating enough because I, the desire of want, which is the dopamine that Peter was referring to, is uh, uh, larger than the satisfaction. Yes, yeah. Which can be anything. Sometimes yeah. if I just say one more thing, sometimes it can be just volume. I want to feel a certain fullness, even though you're full half an hour before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Trigger foods, you know, these are foods that we obsess about. And once we start, it's just, in, for a lot of us, very difficult to have a reasonable portion. Um, yes. I'm going to flip it over to Rachel. She has yeah, I have a question, uh, Peter, uh, about the uh, technology enabled collaborative care platform that that you've been using a lot over this past little while. Um, you know, and, and really, I wanted to ask you about that. Because again, thinking back to the impacts of COVID, I, I guess one of the things that you could see as a good thing or a bad thing is that it's really enabled us to use technology to care for people that are in need of help. Um, so can you tell us about that platform and maybe uh, also about how we can leverage something like that when it comes to food addiction. You're on mute. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was trying to, to prevent that echo. Uh, thank you. Um, so one thing is, you know, I take, a, as I said, because of my understanding of addictions and, and human behavior, I take a developmental, like what happened to people before and, and the interactions between the environment themselves and biology and psychology together and, and, and that biopsychosocial developmental approach. The problem is, if you look at how our health system and our systems are set up, they're all siloed. You know, you go to your primary care doc, then you need to go to the specialist, then you need to go to the hospital, then you need to go to the, the counselor. They're all separate. You're one person, your body moves in one, one, one form. It's not, you know, parceled out, but we treat people like they're little pieces that are, you know, separate. So this collaborative care is one way in which we can do that. And technology can allow us to sort of connect the dots. I hate to say break down the silos because it's impossible to break down silos. We can connect the silos. I mean, you know, farmers don't go breaking down their silos. They connect them and have shoots for them to come out. Uh, so I think our health system, you, you know, each, each silo does a great job, but how do you connect the dots? So, so connecting the dots is using technology as a way and, and in that, you need a coach and you need a navigator who is, who is the primary person who creates connection. So, we, so this whole collaborative care model is, is a relational collaborative care model, which means there's a relationship between the, the coach in the model and the person who's seeking help, as well as that person behind, the coach is also connected and has a relationship with all the specialists and all the people who are critical for that person to get to where their goals are. So that's the model that we've been we've been testing out and, and trying out and, and figuring out how do you do this? Because everybody has their favorite technology. So I want to be technology agnostic. So can the model work? So you want Zoom? Great. You use Zoom. If you have WebEx, that's great. You can use WebEx. If you have your own favorite electronic medical record, that's knock yourself out. Because all of those things are creating barriers for collaboration. So I think in, in, in suddenly in, in, the, in the field of food addiction in, in, in doing that, the other thing that these kinds of technology does is allow you to actually document. Because if you are going to make the case that there is something distinct as food addiction, that it is a, a condition that is like no other, 
There's no overlap. It's not better explained by something else. You're going to need lots of data from lots of people who have this over time to say, yeah, you know what, when you look at this, these are the characteristics. This, it meets the criteria for a disorder. So right now it's, it's expert opinion, right? And we it need to get down to that. So that the, those data that can get collected from people and that they give voluntarily, of course, they get a benefit because their care is better coordinated and you're better able to, to define this condition. So those are all the ways that I would say that this could, could work. And, and what it means is, you know, the people who have the condition are spread all over the place. The experts tend to be concentrated in a city or in, a, in one institution. And what happens is this means that people like, for example, Rachel, you're in Newfoundland. If you needed help, you're stuck. You, you know, that's just because of geography, because, you know, you don't happen to live in Toronto. That, that's nuts that we don't have that ability to break down those barriers. And we have those ability. Like, it's just a mind, mind, mind problem that we don't break down those things. The connections are there. You can, you can do it by technology. So, so that's what we're doing. And I think with this kind of work, you would be able to take this concentrated people of a few specialists and few people who are working in it and basically spread the, 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 you know, the, the care more broadly. So that's just you know, first blush sort of ways in which this model could be used in, in obesity. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's, you know, one of the silver linings of COVID-19 where people are more open to virtual care and understanding that geography is not necessarily a barrier anymore. So I have a final question for you both. Um, you, obesity Action is a very new organization. And so we want to know how can we help your patients in your practice? And we'll start with Vera. Oh, uh, let me think about that question. <laughs> Peter, you take it first. <laughs> okay, Let's start with Peter. So I, I think I'm really, I believe that we at the time in society where, uh, where citizen science needs to come to the fore much more. Uh, that we have, that people, you know, nothing for us without us kind of idea that started with the HIV work, but. Similarly, I think that's where, you know, I, I think driving a lot of this agenda is going to be critical. Uh, you know, I would say finding and, and having a place where people have the voice to, 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 to do that is really critical. And, it, you know, so I, I would say advocacy writ large, but advocacy with and, and science. I mean, I think we think this whole idea that, uh, you know, if you look at the human capital that you can bring together to, to do the science around it, I think that is where it lies. And, and I say, you know, we've got artificial intelligence and deep learning coming in. If you can aggregate a lot of people like-minded and are willing to use their data together to help better define this, I think that would be a huge benefit to the, the, the issue as well as, you know, it will help inform what research and what work happens, as opposed to being top down and we telling everybody else what to do. So I think it's a pivotal time for you to, 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 to seize this moment. Yeah, we couldn't agree more. Over to okay. you. I, uh, thank you, Peter. That was beautiful. Thank you. You, you laid the, the groundwork for, uh, for what, what, I, what I'd like to say. Uh, it, is, it is going to be a citizen adv ad advocacy movement uh, moving up. We, we can't wait for the specialists to tell us. We have to tell them. And I think that what uh, 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 this, this um, uh, organization can do is, I, I said earlier, uh, we need to change the norms, this, the uh, norms about what food is considered good and healthy and what is love and what is not, what is toxic. And also, uh, there's so much uh, shame around around uh, the concept of obesity and uh, difficulty with uh, managing food. I mean, people are so embarrassed by their lack of control around food. And if we can normalize, and I don't wanna say medicalize or pathologize, because I don't like that, but uh, put the blame where it belongs, which is not with me, but with the food that I'm eating. And so that I, 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 we can let go of our shame around that and then therefore the consequences of obesity. So, so yes, the, the political agenda, and then also the social personal one I think you can do here. Yeah, very inspiring for our community. Um, the floor is now open for questions and we will alternate between live questions and the ones in the chat box in order in order or order of reverence. 
uh, relevance, I should say. We encourage you to turn on your camera when you're ready to ask your question, introduce yourself, let us know where you're tuning in from, and let us know who you would like uh, to answer your question. You can virtually raise your hand using the Zoom feature, um, but you can also just turn on your camera and raise your hand. We'll be scanning for that. And I think we already have a raised hand, so we're going to turn it over to Shelly. Go ahead, ask your question. There we go. Um, I'm from Oshawa, and I'm just curious, how do you know you have a food addiction? Is that for Dr. Tarman? That's for either one of them. Oh, okay, great. Uh, do you want to start, uh, Vera, and then... Uh... Uh, sure. Uh, there's there's uh, a number of ways to do this. You can go online and you know look up the 20 uh, questions of uh, food addiction. But uh, really, what, what what when we do in a diagnosis of addiction, we really are looking at sort of four or five fundamental features. One is, do I have an obsessive thought about it? And and, and in other words, in the my day, my, the thought about the food crowds and, and, and becomes intrusive. It gets in the way of other things that I want to do. Um, the second thing is I, I, I have little control. I, I, I try to control it, but I end up eating more than I mean to. Um, is it causing impairment? A am I starting to get um, diabetes because of it or arthritis because of it or something like that? It, it, am I starting to avoid uh, social functions because I'd rather stay at home and eat? That would be the third thing. Um, uh, uh, the, the inability to completely stop at all, even when you want to, because if you stop, you're going to have, um, because of tolerance, you're going to actually have withdrawal. And the withdrawal isn't like a, a heroin with withdrawal. It's the, like Peter was saying, the, I don't feel right. I, I, I need something to feel normal. And I, and it's so long lasting. Like, how do I sleep through the night without having my usual, whatever it is? Um, so if, if I have obsession, if I have impairment, if I can't control, if I, pay the cost of stopping, then we're moving into the realm of addiction. And if you can say yes to those, chances are you're on the road or already there. Peter, do you have anything to add? No, I think that was beautifully said. And, and again, you know, I always put, uh, as a physician, you're a little, you know, we, we, we have to be careful about diagnosing something which we don't have agreement on. But yes. I, I don't worry about the label. I look at what is the harm? And if there is a model of addiction that works to help that person get better and get to where their goals are, then let's go with it. You know, if there's something else, let's go with what it is because, you know, there's no blood test. There's no brain test. There's nothing that I can diagnose any addiction with. Right. I can't, I, I all of, all, all of them are based on what the behaviors are and what the person tells you. So you, you don't have anything that diagnoses addiction. So I, I keep, a, I, I, I try not to force people to wear a label but focus on what, a, what is leading to whatever this thing is. If you want to call it addiction, great. But what are the things, and I always go, what's happening in your development that caused this? What's happening in your current situation, in the environment, in yourself mm -hmm. and others? And where do you want to start with, with getting to that goal, right? So at times we have to suspend that label because they can work both ways. For some people, it enables them. For others, it becomes worse. So, so I'm very careful about labels. I go with where the person is. Uh, Peter. Denise, you have a question. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. This is awesome. I've had like tons of pearls already. I have two part question. Uh, the first is about um, triggers. And uh, what about emotional triggers? I understand the food triggers. And uh, although I have to admit my um, when I've been to registered dietitians and nutritionists, they dispute the uh, the actual physical nature of triggers. And I know from my 12 step uh, experience that largely people report triggers that are specific to certain foods. So I get that. And of course, we all know, just because of basic science, that sugar is definitely something that we overdo, whether that's an addiction or whether it's just an uh, overconsumption, or as you say, uh, you know, society has a certain responsibility on their foods. But the emotional triggers is one thing that I just didn't hear in, in this presentation so far. And I'm wondering about that because I certainly am deep diving in. And I noted yesterday in an experience I had that was a very much an emotional trigger um, uh, from a, a child. <laughs> they can do that. And um, the, you want to <laughs> handle the first part? 
the first part of the question first. Okay. Uh, Dr. Charman, do you want to take that question? Yeah. Um, yes, I'd love to answer that question. So, so really, when, when we talk about addiction, I always like to say this is almost like we're, we're living in a sort of post-traumatic uh, stress, a post-trauma syndrome, because when you're having a, 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 a binge, when you're having a, a huge craving, this is out of the norm of what the brain is built for, which is meant, meant to be eating normal foods. And so you, we, we get triggers. We have in, in, intrusive memories, like with post-traumatic stress, you get the sudden memory, you wake up in the middle of the night, whatever it is, they're intrusive. And similarly with cravings. And we can have um, a sub, subconscious connection. So hunger is a huge trigger uh, because if I'm hungry at night, people and at night, uh, night eat you know the slightest bit of hunger it, it's not even hunger it's it's a reminder that oh this is when i was here before i made the connection that i would now eat and that would make it go away so so you know in the once you take the um the model of addiction you know we have we have tools like halt hungry angry lonely tired when i'm hungry when i'm angry when i'm lonely when i'm tired in the past i ate we have that connection now uh, emotion with this uh with the behavior now this is a fused neurological connection which is a trigger and uh it, it can be a body sensation you can be sad don't even know that you're sad. It's just a feeling in the gut of sad or anger. And then you, and then the trigger is to eat because that's what you've done in the past. And uh, yeah, that's what we need to work with. So if I can just add, I think Diane had a good uh, question there. This, this speaks to the issue of the ads on TV. So what happens is, you know, while we're paying attention, our body's actually paying attention to way more things that are, that are mm -hmm. subconscious. And these are called, you know, we do study, you can do studies in the lab where you put people into brain scanners and they've done this with palatable foods as well as with, with tobacco and other substances. And people who have this pre predisposition will orient and that parts of their brain that are involved with addiction, will, we call it light up. It, essentially that their brain is beginning to pay more and more attention. And I think that's why you see a lot of breakfast food ads in the evening. Uh, and I think one of the things is it's really important if you're predisposed this way is to not let those cues come at you because what that's doing is it's bubbling up. So you're going, you may not have a, a craving at that moment, but then uh, an emotional uh, issue comes up, right? Somebody bothers you. What starts happening is the thinking part of the brain now is beginning to shut down because of the, the, the stress hormones and the emotional part now starts taking over. And then that becomes the driver for that so those emotional cues can become the way that trigger. And then the more it's done and the more comfort you feel, the more you want to eat because that's what's giving you that comfort. I mean, then you're in this other cycle. So it becomes this vicious cycle yes. over time. And, and I think that's one of the things is that uh, that's why that, that, that emotional trigger can become a, a, you know, when we are treating people and, and they're recovering from addiction, it's about, you know, it's not simply detoxifying people. If you detoxify people within in seven days, you can detoxify people. But within a year, 97% of people will have relapsed mm. in any addiction because so to... that is not what keeps it going. It's what has happened to the brain that keeps that, that going. And that is what has to be unlearned or, you know, so that when I'm upset, the normal reaction is to go eat. But what are the things in my people, places, and things in where I am that I can change so that when that emotional trigger comes up, it doesn't lead to the automatic, you know, I'm upset, food. So how have I changed my environment so that it buys me time from when I'm upset to actually reaching for food? Yeah. You know, those are the kinds of things that, that so it's a great question, I think. Great question. And, and I, I'll, I'll just put that back. Denise, you, you said there was a second part to your question. Yeah, and the, uh, because I just got this email from a friend last night to let me know about obesity action, I've never heard of you, so I'll dive into that later, but um, my, my, I, I'll confess the ignorance, <laughs> but uh, I just wondered if there is a um, resource section, for instance, uh, you know, if one's seeking, say, a, like for me, I wanted an internal medicine specialist who knows about, you know, time eating and current trends in food, because our food pyramid is just, uh, a, is a bit dated and so 
I had to really do a lot of homework to find that. It would be really cool to have resources to just know where to search it because Google's going to send you off in all kinds of uh, commercial endeavors. But anyway, and so that was the first thing is that understanding, I mean, we in, in British Columbia, we have one psychiatrist that works with obesity in in the compulsive eating realm, and that's it. And you know, it's a very long wait list, of course. But anyway, just understanding what tools uh, and resources and people, professionals in particular, that can steer us, guide us, and 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 you know, we can uh, yeah. avail ourselves of. Yeah, so that's one of our mandates as obesity action um, to develop a resource um, and curate for our community where to go. Um, and so that's in the works. So stay tuned, stay close to our community, and uh, it will be it will be you know we're a new organization, so that will definitely be coming out. Thank you, Denise. So I'm going to turn it over to Rosie. Do you have any questions from the chat box? Thank you, Sandra. Yes, there's been lots of great conversation in the chat box. Uh, the first question comes from Lauren. Lauren would like to hear your, the panelists' views on the place of probiotics to balance the gut and deal with bacteria presence from the standpoint of obesity and sugar cravings. Okay, I, I won't assign that question. Who would like that question? <laughs> you know, I, I can tell you that we know that there's a shift. We don't know whether, you know, whether changing it with probiotics and the commercial probiotics are gonna do anything or not. Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't, uh, clinically, we haven't seen anything other than when people are quitting smoking and we know that their gut might shift is we really place close attention to their, you know, that we, we make a diet and, and eating healthy is part of it, right? We don't want people to quit smoking and then develop another problem. So, so, so clearly that's how we do it, but I leave it to Vera in case we tend not yeah. to use these. Yeah, I, I would say um, I, I have to claim ignorance to some degree, other than I will say that um, if we quit sugar and processed carbs in general, the, the uh, profound impact of that is far more than uh, pro probiotics, which I see is, and, and I can claim ignorance here, as a tweaking once we've done that. Uh, because I think that in and of itself, making that first intervention will already put us on the right page. I don't know if we need to get additional probiotics, et cetera. I, I fear that that's um, an, a new, another business that's trying to jump in and complicate something that's actually quite simple. Just stop eating the toxic foods and we will write ourselves. Now, you can argue with me on that one, but that's my stand. Thank you. Uh, Rosie, do you have another question from the chat box? Yes, thank you. I have a question from Cynthia Morin. This is for Dr. Tarman. Cynthia asks, I'm curious about how guilt and cravings are best managed. For example, someone stops sugar but keeps having cravings and feels guilty that they can't control themselves. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, let's throw out that word guilt because uh, it, it's, it's already an assumption that I have control and I'm not controlling myself and there's something wrong with me. If, if um, uh, the, my client or myself or whatever uh, continues to have cravings, the, the, then the, the mandate is look to the food. What is promoting that craving? What is continuing the craving? It's not me unless it's a, a, a trigger like hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Um, what is the... Uh, factor, the external factor that is, uh, it could be internal too, but um, that is promoting that trigger um, so that it's, it's not a question of self-will and it's not this moral ethic of I should be strong enough. It's what is, what is eroding the strength? Because otherwise I would, I, I don't want to do this and I, I need help. So I need to figure out what it is. Um, so I would really uh, urge that this is not about self-loathing. And, and in fact, when people really buy into the food addiction platform, that's one of the first things that goes is that I don't need to feel bad about myself anymore. It's not that I have a disorder, although I could argue that that, that might be happening, but that there is a disorder in my circumstance. And I'm, and I'm going to look and try to change that rather than blame myself. Yes. Um, I have a question here from Megan. She emailed it in, so I want to make sure to get an answer for her. So her question is, both terms, food addiction and emotional eating, are stigmatizing. Is there anything wrong with emotional eating? I believe these terms just make people feel shameful, and I don't feel the goal should be management. It should be intuitive. 
So what is your opinion? So maybe we'll start with uh, Peter. Yeah, I, you know, I, so my approach in general with people who come to see me and is, first of all, I get a sense of how do they conceptualize what's going on? You've, have, you've got to start with where people are at because there is no right, you know, I can't claim I'm right and neither can they. So I just say, where are you at with this? How do you understand what's going on? How do you make sense of what it is? And uh, you start there. And at the end of the day, is the label the most important thing or are these elements which we know are determinants of what is happening. You know, what happened to you? What's happening to you? What are the opportunities and constraints that are making this behavior happen under what circumstances and where? So it just takes away all that, that shame, guilt, good. Things that I avoid are language like I've been good, I've been bad. That completely is out the window. So we talk about that, getting rid of the, that kind of language. We talk about each opportunity where there has been uh, the emergence of that behavior again it to, as an opportunity to learn and say course correct. Mm -hmm. So we say, okay, it's like learning. It, you know, I use the metaphor. If you're, if you're teaching a child to ride a bike, the first time they fall off the bike, if you, you shame them, do you, do, will that kid ever get back on the bike? No, you, you can't, right? So the, the, how about you know, that not shaming and getting back on the bike and like, what will it take to get back on the bike, you know? Uh, and, and some people need training wheels and say, okay, so what's your, tra what training wheels would you need? Is it, you know, and then we can talk about medications as being necessary in those situations or, and, or, you know, what other things can help you with therapy or classes. And so you approach it at, at the way that people can go. And I think, you know, calling it one or the other. I'm, I'm open, you know, call it what you will. People yeah. are suffering. That's the key issue, right? And, you know, the, the question brought up the word intuitive. Right? Yes, can I comment like, on that? Yeah, yes, please do. <laughs> okay, so intuitive works when it's a normal food environment. Uh, when it's just apples and cherries and bananas and, and, and vegetables, intuitive works. When it's a toxic food environment where the food has been manipulated, and I'm also coming into the scene because I have a, a already a battered system either through previous drugs or through previous food food eating, um, it's no longer intuitive. Some, some, some disorder has taken over. Uh, and it's no longer just emotional. Uh, these are the goals we want to get to, to be able to get at some point to intuitive eating once we're in, living in a normal food environment, which is a non-processed food environment. Thank you. Important point to make. Um, Rosie, back to you for the chat box. Great. Thank you. We have a question from Kathleen Budd. Kathleen says, if the only way to stop a tobacco addiction is to quit cold turkey and tobacco addiction is similar in impact to sugar food addiction, does that mean that the only way to overcome the sugar addiction is to quit the same way? Do you want to start, Dr. Tarman? Yeah, happy to take that. Actually, the only way to quit tobacco is not cold turkey. It works for some and it's the commonest way that people try. Uh, but I can tell you that, again, that relapse curve is really high and different things work for different people. I mean, it, you know, the way I look at it is, is, is recovery is a process, it's not an event. You may remember the event, you know, it's like we all remember that moment where you, you know, when you, when you rode your bike without anybody holding behind you and you got going on your own, but it took a lot of work to get there, right? And lots of falls and like, you know, not making it, but we don't remember all that. We remember the, the time when we, we took off. So, but it, so to answer your question, yeah, for some people, a sudden stop is there, but I look at it as a milestone. Yes, the first step is, can you go a day? Mm -hmm. Can you go seven days? Can you mm -hmm. go a month? Can you go three months? And the reason why I put it into milestones is that people don't can't all do it all at once for some people. They need to spend time to get to that one day. And the seven days is usually when your body is going through withdrawal. You Most withdrawals, acute withdrawals last seven days. And some people can't make it through that. So you have to work with them to help them get through those seven days. And it yeah. may take people two months before they get seven continuous days before they can go and say, ah, I think I'm on the other side of this. So I've, take, I've gone away from time-based kind of programs or we have a four week program, a six week program to say, what are the milestones you, need, you want to achieve and, how, and what's it going to take to get to them? And when you've got that milestone now, let's work on the next one. So <laughs> that's how I do it. Yeah. I and I don't, and I don't say this 
This is the only way that everybody has to just stop it suddenly. You may choose to do it, but you need then to be in an environment where access yeah. has been taken away. And then you have something else that's taking care and you know, stimulating your body so that you're not uncomfortable all the time, you know? Yeah, I yeah. think that's an important point to make that sometimes getting seven days can take two months. Um, Dr. Tarman, you wanted to add? Well, you know, when, when Renaissance had the uh, food addiction programming, we, we locked people up for a month. So you're right. Like if you can uh, eliminate access and give tons of support, that's a great way to stop cold turkey. If you can't do that, which is most likely the case, um, then uh, uh, it, it, it really depends on the person. Some people just want to jump in the cold water and just get it over with. But there's other people who want to, you know, stick their foot in and then their, their leg, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, the thing is, is that you're prolonging the agony if you prolong it. But it's not as much agony so you have to decide yourself do i want to do the cold hard splash or do i want to do it slowly i'll stop the pop and then i'll stop the juice and then i'll stop the flour and the processed food then i'll stop the sweeteners i mean and so that it just know that on month three if you're asking why do i still have cravings it's not as bad as it was before you started but you're still having them because you're still eating triggering foods so just build in patience um, if you're going to do the uh, slow way, um, it's it, you 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 pick your hell. It's going to be hell. It's going to be either a month of she, not, pardon me, a week of real real difficulty or a few months of lesser difficulty. But you're you're going to get there in the end. Thank you, Rosie. Did you have another question? Yes, thank you. We have a question from Michelle McMillan. Michelle asks, do you think society's normalization of food addiction interferes with diagnosis and treatment of food addiction? For example, I can tell myself I had a bad day, it's socially acceptable, I can feel encouraged to have a pint of ice cream. Hmm. Who would like to take that one? I don't Sarah? understand. Yeah, so no, I think, you know, you're right. I mean, if you look at, so you know this, if you look at uh, the tobacco industry was very influential in, in if you look at the number of Hollywood stars and, and heroes who smoke, it's way beyond what you would expect in society. So there's a huge amount of product placement and normalization of these behaviors as a way to keep people triggered and going. Many of my patients who quit smoking say they can't watch a movie because it just triggers them so much to go and have a cigarette. Uh -huh. And don't forget there's product placement with foods. And, and food appears, and, and these processed foods do appear, and, and you do see these kinds of things normalized, right? The whole idea that, you know, if you think about products of consumption, whether it's cigarettes, alcohol, they, the way that they can keep going is if they make it part of the culture, right? Yes. If yes. you make it part of the culture, then you don't need advertising because it's just self-propelling. Mm. And, and deep, getting out of that requires a lot of us to say, hey, first of all, Let's call this out for what it is, right? You know, that, that if you think about it, in a short period of time, look at how our culture has changed. We think nothing if halfway through a conversation, someone suddenly goes up and starts looking at their phone and texting people. Like that would have been seen as the most rude thing you would ever do, right? Uh, but we do that. So it's, it's interesting how things can come into our culture. So the same thing with food. I think it's been, it's, we have to be careful with these things and call them out because if it is commercial interest, if there is product, that's how the tobacco industry got called out, right? Because they found that they were paying off Hollywood and they, to put that in. So, yeah. so, and the writers were being paid off. So that calling them out created this, this issue. So. All right, I think we have one time for one last question from the chat box. Oh, Rosie, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you. We have a question from Yvonne Alexander. I have actually found being abstinent from sugar and flour easier during COVID. My fear is what will happen when family celebrations and eating at restaurants resume? Any suggestions on protecting my abstinence as we move out of COVID? Vera, do you want to take this question? I, all I can say is I know, I know, I know, I so empathize, uh, but that's why we need organizations like this. And it, it's, it, it's really just to emphasize what Peter just said. We have to um, uh, voice out, call out these things. This is, you know, so that if I say I'm, I'm quitting smoking, people applaud. I'm quitting sugar. I want the same applause. I want the person that's getting the dessert to have to stand outside of, in the winter, like, like, like with the smokers. Um, <laughs> I want that kind of respect. And until then, I don't know what to say. 
<laughs> no, I, I, you know what? I, I feel that this is something, I think it, you know, COVID has taught us a whole bunch of stuff, not all bad. There's been a lot of good stuff that has come. And I think it's been a time of reflection. And I think it's a values clarification time for all of us. So I, I would say when this happens is, is think about I, my question to people, and this is no different than somebody who's you know, developing a, an alcohol use disorder and now is to say, I have to get back into my workplace and there's drinking everywhere. So we talk about how do you manage to protect yourself? What's your exit strategy should you get craving? How are you in tune with what matters to you and what's happening so that it doesn't become like, a, you, know, a, 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 you know, that you're just gonna end up drinking. You, you can protect yourself. You know, people do recover from alcohol problems and go out and socialize and sit in bars, but don't drink. Mm -hmm. And other people around them, and that doesn't trigger them anymore. So it's like learning the behavioral, settling the system down, that that relevance doesn't lead to a trigger. And there's lots of therapies to how to create that disconnect when things that were previously triggered and learned don't necessarily activate your body in the same way. So, so that's recovery, right? That your, your purpose is now focused on things that are different. Your identity is differently defined not so much by that dessert you ate or whatever high caloric food you ate, but who you are. And that's, that's a process, right? And, and you know, I just wanna top on, on top of that, uh, that um, Peter, what you've just illustrated is tools from the food addiction toolbox. And so that's why we need to start using this word food addiction and to say, you know, let's, let's, let's take this term on because it opens up a whole set of tools, exactly what you've described that are gonna help us post COVID. Thank you. That was a great way to close off today's session. We offer our sincere thanks to Peter and Vera for generously giving us your time today. My biggest takeaway really is that there are many, many roads to recovery. And using Peter's words, we need to meet people where they are um, and what works for them in their situation. Rachel, do you want to add your biggest takeaway? Yeah, mine is to be curious. You know, I often get these cravings and it feels like it's out of nowhere. But, you know, I think it was, uh, you know, Peter that said earlier, your body is, you know, it might not necessarily be conscious. There's a lot of other things that can signal uh, the start of a craving. So I'm going to, you know, acknowledge that craving, ask why I'm having it and pause before I give into that. You know what I do? If I have a craving, I like dance or I listen to music. So that way I don't go to the craving. Oh, that's a great idea. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I actually lost weight because I'm not eating as much, I find. That's fantastic. That's a wonderful, yeah. joyous way to deal with a craving. So get involved as a member of our Obesity Action community. Please visit our website at obesityaction.ca where you will find those resources to come. We will be sending out a survey and would appreciate you completing it so we can continue to build programs that are recommended by you, our community. So be sure to tune in for our finale next week, which is the unapologetic pursuit of deliciousness. And our guest is my, Dr. Michael Lyon. So that'll be on April the 8th, Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I hope you all enjoy your day. Thanks for coming on in and we'll see you next week. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Peter, can I see your mug? Can you show your mug again? It says, uh, <laughs> or, <laughs> or you are muted. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. I want one of those. <laughs>